Well, it's great <coughs> so many people gathered here uh, to admire and remember Arthur Pryor. Um, I, I, don't, uh, I don't envy the two speakers in the next session having to follow Tony Kenny and Max Cresswell. They were a very difficult act to follow. Um, but I'm sure we're going to have two superb talks now from uh, Kit Fine and Patrick Blackburn. Um, Kit needs absolutely no introduction, so I won't attempt to give one. He did so much work bringing out Arthur Pryor's later thinking on times, worlds, and selves. And his talk this morning is Pryor's Reductive Project in Worlds, Times, and Selves. Thank you. It's a, it's a great pleasure and honor to be giving this talk, especially given how important Pryor was for both the intellectual and personal level in my life. Very much appreciate being invited here. Um, Tony Kenny talked about Arthur's intellectual strengths, uh, one of which was in bringing together logic and philosophy. I would like to mention another great intellectual strength he had, which was his open openness of mind. He really did consider many different options. I think he regarded logic as open in that way, as, as neutral between different philosophical stances. And he certainly was willing to consider using logic in the service of different intellectual stances. I think in this respect, um, there's a, a huge contrast between him and uh, another great philosopher and magician, Quine. Uh, Quine, of course, is famous for writing two dogmas of empiricism, which he attempted to shoot down two dogmas, but he himself was one of the most dogmatic of all philosophers. Um, and I think it's interesting to compare Quine and Pryor in this respect. Two of Quine's great dogmas were first, that there's no meaningful distinction between the analytic and the synthetic, or between what's necessary and what's contingent. And another great dogma of his was that all quantification is nominal. Uh, you're going to properly replace something nominal by a quantifier. Now, of course, in these two respects, Pryor stood in great contrast uh, to Quine. Uh, Pryor certainly was happy uh, with modality and using modal operators. Uh, and also, he was a great advocate of the view that uh, quantification needn't be nominal. Quantifiers could take sentential or predicate position, for example. It seems to me that in both of these regards, Quine's dogmas had a really pernicious uh, effect on subsequent uh, philosophy, especially in regard to the modal view. I mean, there's no doubt, looking in retrospect, that Quine's, that Quine's views held philosophy back. Um, uh, and uh, I think something, perhaps not to the same extent, his views on quantification were also the same. Again, looking back, it's clear that we should have been much more receptive to the possibility of non-nominal forms of quantification. So I think that, first of all, that this is one of, great, one of Pryor's great strengths, this kind of open-mindedness. Uh, and secondly, I think that that open-mindedness really had a very beneficial influence on subsequent, subsequent philosophy. Um, towards the end of his life, um, Pryor was working on a project which involved making sense of possibilist discourse from an actualist point of view. So the possibilist believes in possible objects, there are many possible people, many possible electrons, and so on and so forth. Um, the actualist only takes seriously actual objects, actual people, actual electrons, <coughs> and the like. But when the possibilist says what he says, it seems to make good sense. And so the question arises as to how the actualist might make sense of it. So to take a concrete example, Suppose I have three handles and three blades. They haven't been put together. And I ask, how many possible knives can I make from the three handles and the three blades? Well, the correct answer is nine, of course, because I can place any one of the blades and any one of the handles. Clearly, there's something correct in saying that there are three possible knives I can make from these handles and blades. Let's suppose that the handles of blades are never put together. They're incinerated as soon as I ask the question. Okay. Then these possible knives are not actual knives. They're many possible knives. Okay. So how can the actualist, who doesn't believe, only believes in actual knives, so to speak, 
make sense of that claim. So this is the, the great challenge uh, for the activist. Um, Prior himself made some headway in dealing with this, this problem. And in, um, uh, in the prologue I wrote to World Bank <coughs> Cells, I attempted to continue the, uh, the project. And I made a quite specific suggestion as to how the actualist might simulate possibilist discourse. Um, so let me briefly explain what the suggestion was. Suppose we use this to mean there's a possible object, x. Uh, then the rough idea is, uh, let's use this for there is an actual object, x. So somehow we must understand that in terms of this, just making use of ordinary modal idioms. Okay. Well, an obvious thought is this, that if I say there is a possible object such as f of x, there's a possible knife, there's a, possible x, there's a possible x such that x is a knife. This means possibly there is an x, an actual x such that it's a knife. Okay. This won't quite do, because what this, this will be true in the actual world, if in the actual world there's a possible object that f's. Whereas this were, it will be true in the actual world if there's some possible world, in which, which is such that in that possible world there's an object, an actual object in that possible world that f's. But we want to go back to the actual world. There are different ways of doing that. Vlack introduced these operators, like so. <coughs> so when we evaluate, we start off in the actual world, we go to another possible, here's the actual world, we go to another possible world, and then this operator takes us back to the actual world, and we evaluate this here. So in effect, we go to a possible world, take an actual object from that possible world, take ourselves back to the actual world, and consider whether that object has a property F. Um, if you didn't want to use these operators, Again, using sentential quantification, we can say there's, pro uh, there's a P, which shows that P is the true world proposition, proposition completely describing, correct, completely and correctly describing the actual world. And uh, it's possible that there is an X such that necessarily P implies FX. So if we didn't want to use the black operators, we could do that. So again, P completely describes the world. P is only true here. We say there's, it's possible that there's an object here. And necessarily, whenever P is true, well, the only place P is true is here, f of x. Okay. So that was the, um, uh, that was the proposal. Um, now, this only deals um, with first order quantification, quantification uh, over individuals. And it only deals with the straight existential quantifier, and of course also with the universal quantifier. But what about extending this account to generalize what we call generalized quantifiers, um, or to higher order operators, to sets of objects, or properties of objects, or properties of properties of objects? Um, this is a question uh, that I briefly considered uh, uh, and I was aware that there was, there was a certain problem, which is the problem of uh, incompossibles. Uh, possible objects, you may have two possible objects, both, so both can be actual, but it's not possible for them simultaneously to be actual. So they can't both, it's impossible for them both to be co-actual. Um, suppose, for example, that when you these are magic, I never told you this, but these are magic blades and, and magic handles. And whenever you put a blade to a handle, it can never be separated again. <laughs> okay. okay. So then, uh, here's a handle and here's a blade. Here's another handle and here's a blade. I can put that handle with that blade, or I can put that, ha that handle with that blade. So these are two possible knives. One formed from this blade, one formed from that blade with the same handle. But they're not compossible. <laughs> They can't both coexist because I, I have to make a choice as to which they will go with that. Okay. Um, now, you might think, well, let's suppose I want to mimic quantification over sets of possible objects. So I say this now means there's a possible set 
of possible objects. This, this means, yeah, this, here I'm quantifying, this quantifies range of possible objects. This is range over sets of these possible objects. So there's a set of possible objects. And suppose I want to simulate that kind of quantification. Well, there's a problem if I use the same technique. If I say possibly, there's an actual set, which is such that blah, blah, blah. Why is that? Because a set uh, will be actual, presumably, for the actualist, only if, in the given possible world, only if all of its members are actual. For the set to be actual, all of its members must be actual. So that means I can go to a possible world, for example, in which this handle is put with this knife. I can go to a possible world in which it's put with that knife. But now consider these two possible knives, call them knife one and knife two, which, which are not compossible. Okay. The set of those two knives will not be actual. They'll not, not, not even be possibly actual. There'll be no possible world in which that set is actual, because there's no possible in which both those knives are actual. So, in effect, I won't be um, quantifying, I'll only be quantifying over some of the sets that I want to be, when I try to simulate what the possible is, is saying. So this is a huge, this is a huge problem. Um, and it's a problem that's not just confined to sets, it also uh, comes up when you have these generalized quantifiers, ones that can't just be expressed in first order terms. Also, when you just use general higher order apparatus talking about properties and properties and properties and so on. So, forth. Okay. so um, the big, big challenge for the actualist is to extend this technique uh, to the higher order. Okay. Now, I did actually make. Um, some suggestions as to how to do that in worlds, times, and cells. Uh, and also, I wrote a subsequent paper um, uh, on the topic. And um, this view has been criticized by uh, Timothy Williamson in his recent book uh, on modal logic as metaphysics. And it's actually, it's, this is a wonderful book. Uh, it was written almost 50 years after. Uh, Prior, and I find it interesting and heartening that 50 years after Prior had these ideas, they're still being actively, actively discussed. It's a great tribute to, to him, I think, that this is the case. Um, now, what I'm not going to do is discuss uh, Williamson's critique of my original ideas, but suggest a, a variant of those ideas and try to show, at least as best I can within the limited time I have, how um, one can avoid the criticisms that, uh, that Timothy Williamson makes. I should mention that um, um, some of the work in this area has been done by someone in the audience, Peter Fritz. Uh, he actually showed, uh, in sort of a very precise way, um, how the actualist was limited in, in the kind of possible discourse that could be still simulated. Some very nice technical results on that, on that matter. Let me let me begin with a a very general remark, and then um, try to flesh it out. There's something that you might call the modal pluriverse. So the pluriverse is the all the possible world. So we've got different worlds in them. In them. And then, if we imagine that we're given certain relations and properties and so on, and certain, uh, certain individuals, each world will have a kind of profile in terms of how things are. In this world, we have RAB, FA, and so on and so forth. And what will be especially important for our purposes is that, at least for the actualist, there'll be a distinction between the objects within each world, the objects that are actual and those that are not. So here I've drawn this, this is the barrier <laughs> between the things that are actual and those that are not. 
So this is the realm of non-being or non-actuality. Okay. Now, so this is the modal pluribus. The actualist and the possibilist have a different conception of the modal pluribus. Because all the all that the actualist sees is this. He, this bit of the thing doesn't really have any real existence for him. Okay. He can't make sense of it. The only way he can make sense of it is this. He, he can make sense of ob objects here, and then he can talk about how they behave in other worlds. But he has to find, as it were, all he can see is this, at least in the first place. I might add an incidental remark. Prav was very fond of a system Q. I suspect if you try to do everything I'm trying to do in the system Q, it would be, a, it would be hopeless. So I suspect that uh, uh, but Prav's two, two views that he had. One is that we need this kind of reduction or simulation of possible discourse, and the other is that we should work with the logic Q. I suspect those two things cannot actually be combined. Okay. But anyway, I'm not working within the system Q. Okay, so that's, intuitively speaking, the actualist conception of the modal pluribus. That's how things look <laughs> in large. Mm -hmm. Okay, the possibilist conception is different. The possibilist sees all this stuff, all this stuff to the left of it of the actualist barrier. Okay. All right. So he'll think, you know, well, there's us, concrete individuals, and so on. And there are all these possible individuals in the actual world. Okay. In some sense, just as real as the actual individuals. But, you know, they don't laugh or cry or hold conferences and so on. They have a very dull, dreary life. Okay. Uh, and probably just as good to be, probably no better. Existence probably doesn't even count for much. <laughs> all right. So, the thought one might have is this. And this is really my guiding thought. If the actualist can make sense of the modal pluribus from the possibilist point of view, that is, if the actualist can make sense of this expanded picture where the, this actualist barrier is removed, then there should not be an additional problem as to how to extend that conception of the modal pluribus to the higher levels. The conception we had was a, was a first order conception, a conception in which the modal pluribus was simply constituted by the relations and properties among individuals. But of course, we want to be able to extend the modal pluribus so that it also deals not only with individuals, but with sets of individuals, with properties, and properties of properties of individuals. Okay. The thought is this. If the actualist can make sense of the modal pluribus from the possibilist point of view, that is the first order modal pluribus, there shouldn't be an additional problem about the higher order universe. So that should just take care of itself. Because he'll have, once he sees this whole thing, his general understanding of what sets and properties there are should enable him to determine how things are. Okay, so that's, that's the underlying picture. And I've always actually believed this, but without being able to articulate it before. So <laughs> somehow, if one can take care of quantification of the possible individuals, there should not even be an issue over generalized quantifiers or higher order quantifiers. They should, we, we somehow have misunderstood how to understand this apparatus if we think there's a separate issue. Okay. All right. So let me, this is sort of hand waving, let me try to articulate it. Um, and they're really, uh, I should mention these are thoughts I've very recently had. So they're, they may come across half-baked, and they may even be half-baked. Okay. The, in trying to flesh out this idea, there are really three steps, which I call the one of specifying. We specify the 
the pluribus. So the actions must make sense of the modal pluribus from his own point of view. Then we must modify. That is, given this conception of the pluribus from the actions point of view, he wants to modify it so as to get a conception of the pluribus from the positivist point of view. And then he needs to amplify. He needs to show how this conception of the possibilis of the modal pluribus from the positivist point of view can be amplified or extended to higher order entities or generalized point of view. So those are the three steps involved. So let me first of all mention um, how, how can the modal actualist um, conceive of the modal of the, of the pluribus. He wants to describe the whole command. Okay. Well, he can do it as follows. He can say, look, there are some possible individuals. There's a possible object x1, there's a possible object x2. This is a very long string of quantifiers. And he wants to say these These possible individuals are all the possible individuals that are on. These are actually quantifiers. So this is all done in the actualist language. So necessarily any object is one of these. So these says that these are all the possible individuals. And now he starts describing each possible world. He says possibly. And now, he's, now, now he gives this description of how things might be with respect to these individuals. He might say R, X1, X2, blah, 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 blah. Um, and then possibly this, and so on. So in effect, he's describing each possible world. And then he wants to say these are, are all the possible worlds. So necessarily, we are either have this, or we have that, or we have that. So this is an actualist, an actualist, expectable formula, which gives a complete description of the modal of the pluribus okay. from the actual's point of view. I say it's from the actual's point of view because when I describe each world, I'm going to say some of these individuals exist, but I'm going to say that some of them don't exist. I'm going to say maybe in this universe, uh, I just use existence here. Remember that we've got all of these possible individuals. So in this world, this may, be our, this may be our world. Perhaps it's not true that X1 exists. It's not the case. So these descriptions in here will say, look, these objects don't exist, but these do. Okay. All right. So that's the specification of the pluriverse from the actual's point of view. This is not the way the possibilist conceives of things. Because the possibilist, the actualist says there are these existential barriers. There's this distinction here between the things that are actual or the things that exist and the things that don't. The possibilist says, oh, no, no, no. These things all exist. No existential barrier. Okay. So that means that the, um, we have to modify this description. Oh, I should actually add another thing. This is what I call the pluriverse. Uh, there's something which you might call the centered pluriverse. And in the centered pluriverse, you pick out one of the worlds as actual. You say, and this is how things actually are. So let's, let's suppose that dot, dot, dot. This was one of the possibilities. Maybe that possibility is the act as how things actually are. So all I need to do is take one of these possibilities and say it's actually the case. And that will give me a description of the centered pluribus. Okay. All right. So how do I modify uh, this description so as to get a description of the possibilist uh, pluribus? I just replace these things here by exists. I, in effect, what I do is I have this barrier, I said. 
I remove the barrier, or I don't really remove it, I move it to the extreme, I, I move it to the extreme left. So all of these things before, which I took not to exist, now just exist. Okay. So this is now the modification of the description. This is not how the actor thinks things are. He's just de describing, giving a modified description of a hypothetical pluribus, which correspond, which is corresponds <coughs> to his pluribus. It's how the possibilist <coughs> conceives of the pluribus. So he can meaningfully form this hypothesis as to how things are from the possibilist point of view. Now, we come to amplification. This is now a hypothesis, one hypothesis, as to how things are from the uh, Possible's point of view. And what, I, I have to say, I'm sliding over lots of technical details here. Now what that actually can say to himself is, look, given that this is the correct hypothesis as to how the pluriverse is, given that this, that this is given, and this is a big hypothesis here, <laughs> then This would be true. And now, this statement A can talk about, gen talk about generalized quantifiers, uh, whatever you like. It can talk about uh, sets and so on and so forth. Because we're now acting under the hypothesis, which the actress doesn't think is the case, doesn't even think it's medically possible, we're acting under that. So, making, acting under the hypothesis, that this is how things are. And under that hypothesis, we can then say, then this is what sets there would be. This is what properties there would be, and so on so, so, so forth. Okay. Now, this is a little bit like um, a suggestion uh, that Peter Fritz and Jeremy Goodman consider in their paper, which are called the counterfactual analysis, where what you do is you counterfactually suppose that necessarily everything necessarily exists and ask what would follow. And they point out quite correctly that when we make that counterfactual hypothesis, we don't know what to keep fixed. Okay. Maybe the reason the counterfactual hypothesis is true is because the only things that exist are abstract entities which necessarily exist, which is not what we really wanted. Okay. And I'll make, a, I'll make a general comment here about counterfactual analyses. They're very popular. But the interpretation of a counterfactual often depends on what, what it is that we want to keep fixed. And often I think that the counterfactual analysis only works because we have to explain in terms of what we're trying to analyze, what it is we want to keep fixed. And so the counterfactual analysis really does no work. I think it's probably, it's probably true almost for every counterfactual analysis. So I myself am no big fan of counterfactual analyses, just for this reason. That if, if the analyses are correct, then you have to presuppose in your account of what's kept fixed, the very notion you're trying to analyze, what's, if it's cause knowledge or what have you. This, so here we are making this counterfactual hypothesis that this is how the, what the pluriverse is like. But this use of the counterfactual, that's what we want to call it, is not subject to this difficulty. Because I have made absolutely clear, at least at the ground level, what it is I want to keep fixed. I keep fixed at the ground level everything as an actress I wanted to say, but modulo the existence of something. The thought then is this, and this is, this is really quite decisive. It's part of our general understanding of generalized quantifiers, properties, or sets, that once we know how things are at the ground level, it's then determined how things are higher up. There isn't an issue. Okay. Or if there is an issue, it's a quite general issue that has nothing to do with the hypothesis that you're considering. One has, this is a very important point about this kind of discourse, one has what one might call a generic understanding of that discourse. It's not just that I know what properties or sets there are, so to speak, or that's somehow given. I also know under a, 
alternative hypotheses as to what might be given at the ground level, what properties or sets there are. Maybe there are only three individuals, okay? Then there'll be uh, two to the three uh, sets of these individuals. But it's not as if my thinking is confined to there just being three individuals. I know exactly how things would be if there were four individuals and what have you. <laughs> so the point is this, that it's no special understanding of the counterfactual that enables us to interpret this. It's our general understanding of property set generalized quantifier talk that enables us to understand this. Okay. So that's the new proposal. Um, one thing I like about it is articulates something I've always thought, that there should not be a separate problem about um, the higher order business. Okay. Um, now, I don't know how much time I have left. Oh, a fair bit. So, good. Uh, well, there should be time for discussions. Oh, yeah. Hmm. If you want. So, yeah. yeah, no, that, I mean, or if they want. Mm -hmm. um, so, so should the discussion start? Well, no. I, should I make one... one Maybe I can make one, one further yes, point. Yes, please. There are two key criticisms that um, Williamson makes of my former proposals, uh, which might, which if correct, would also apply uh, to the, the present proposal. Um, I'll mention both of them. One, one is, is this that the actualist cannot properly understand this infinite string of quantifiers. That's one. Uh, the second is there are cardinality issues. I, I said, jokingly, this is um, a very long quantifier. And the criticism is maybe it's too long. You know, we're, we're having cardinality problems here. If this sentence is meant to be a set, then there has to be a set of these variables. But that means that we have a set of possible individuals, and there's no reason to assume that we do have a set of possible individuals. Uh, I think both criticisms can be taken care of, but let me just deal with the first criticism, because I think it raises some issues of great interest in their own right. Okay. So clearly, I can understand a finite quantifier string like this. Possibly there is an x1, possibly there is an x2. Uh, Timothy makes the interesting observation that that doesn't guarantee that I have an understanding of, of an infinitely long quantified strip. And then you can see this various hypotheses as to why you might be able to make sense of, of an infinite quantified string and find some all lacking. Uh, one of those hypotheses is the following. But we should not really think of this as a string but there's a branching quantifier. Possibly there's an X1, possibly there's an X2, blah, 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 blah. And then we'll have, maybe I should have to do it like this. So many of you may will be familiar with, with branching quantifiers. Okay. So this is an idea that neither none of these quantifiers are within the scope of the other. So there's no scoping going on. And what he says is that the usual way of understanding branch of quantifiers is in, is in terms of scalar functions. And these scalar functions will actually involve reference to, to possible individuals. Um, so uh, it actually cannot give the usual explanation of, this, of, uh, of these branch of quantifiers. I, I don't want to, I, I, I'm not sure that criticism is quite on the mark. But I just want to make a point that just avoids the criticism altogether, as the relevance of the criticism. The question we ask is this. When can we make sense of, of branching quantifiers, or generally branching operators? If I did this, not, 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 A, I'm saying, oh, this is a branching negation. No, neither negation, none of these negations are in the scope of the other. You wouldn't know how to make sense of that. <laughs> not, 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 not. These are, these are not sequential knots, sir. A, it has no clear meaning. So when can we give a clear, clear meaning, this is the general question of interest, when can we give a clear meaning to some branching operators? Mm -hmm. Some operators, no, no one of which falls within the scope of the other, at least in this extreme case. I think that what's going on here 
is that we have this general notion of two actions being independent of one another. Suppose I ask you to turn on that light and ask you that some other person to turn off that light. Those are two actions that can be simultaneously performed. They can be also performed sequentially as well, but they can be simultaneously performed. Okay. Now I say, I ask you to turn on that light, and simultaneously I ask someone else to turn it off. I say, get to it. Simultaneous mind, not sequentially. Can't be done. Can't be done. So these are not independent actions. So there is the notion of actions that could be performed independently of one another. Okay, this is a very interesting notion in its own right. I'm sure it's been discussed in computer science under the rubric of parallel processing. Because clearly, parallel processing depends on the possibility that the actions performed in parallel should be independent of one another. The key to understanding this is the following. I've talked to bef before about actions. These are now semantic actions. These are operations that perform a semantic function. They convert, just as you can turn on the light, they convert one meaning into another meaning. So these are semantic actions or semantic operations, or at least they signify such. And the fact is, if then these semantic operations are independent of one another, if as it were I have one person performing the one semantic operation to get the meaning, another person performing the other, as long as they can perform those actions in semantic actions independently, I've made perfectly good sense of this, of this branching quantifier. Now in this case, as long as these variables are all distinct, and that's important, then it can be done. Because as it were, one of the people who's performing one of these actions is just looking, doing his work on x1, so to speak, and the other is just doing his work on x2. So there's no need for the, uh, for the actualist to ascend to some higher semantic level, center of matter language, and appeal to possible objects to explain what this means, he simply has to observe, look, these are independent semantic operations. And so there's no difficulty in understanding what it is simultaneously performed. So let me end up. Thank you, Kit. <laughs> so we have uh, about 10 minutes of questions. Um, would you like to uh, no, you choose your own question? No, you, you. All right. Uh, Max, I think your hand went up. One little, little question. It links a little bit with what you said about Q. Um, this new, what is the status in this of, does it require the ability of something to be have something true of it at a world where it doesn't exist? Like Yes. Yeah, and uh, the reason I make that is that I see no problem for actualists in that assumption, mm. but I have a hunch that this is one of the things that Pryor didn't like, you know, right. the idea of existence is, you can't, to exist is to have things true about you. Right, exactly. So, um, so when I go back to the old diagram, if you can imagine it, when I imagine the actions making sense of the possibilist pluriverse, uh, the way he did it really was to say, take an actual individual in this world, and then, it, then, and then take it to another world where it doesn't exist, and he's able to say, oh, yeah. it's possible that that thing, it's possible I don't exist, yeah. but, but you do, and so on and so forth. Yeah. And um, so he, he can, he's there by describing a, a little bit of the possibilist pluriverse. For Pryor, that, Pryor wouldn't allow that. So he couldn't do this. So Pryor, given his general views, couldn't get at the possibilist pluriverse in the way that I've been doing it. Yeah, and that's yeah. why, in a sense, Q has worried about bivalence. Right, right, yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 So I, I, that was really what lay behind my remark that I didn't think any of this could be done yeah. in Q. I, I yeah. So this is, it's kind of interesting, because this, this, I think, really speaks to a, a real tension in Pryor's views. Mm. Um, yeah. Yeah. So we had a question after that. So what in, uh, uh, why in light of the the cardinality words, in the end, you didn't try to solve your problem in a slightly different way by making use of uh, quantification of a, a maximal proposition. So the problem that you think that, that, the, that the actualist, on your view, has is how to how to quantify, uh, sorry, how, how to talk about sets whose elements 
live in different possible worlds, like the nine possible knives, mm. they, they never live in the same uh, world altogether. Well, some do, but, but yeah, some of them do. Yeah, but all nine yeah, yeah. Uh, are in the same world. So I was wondering why, instead of doing uh, the thing that he presented here, why don't you just add the ability to quantify over sets of propositions? All of these maximum world propositions, and then to say that uh, there are nine possible knives, is to say that there are these nine propositions, and each proposition entails a different sort of knife claim, and that's the end of it. Well, the uh, I'm not sure I fully understood your proposal, but the actress is going to have the same qualms about propositions as he has about sets, so he might well think that a proposition only exists in a given possible world if it can be specified in actual terms. So. Um, the possibilist couldn't actually quantify over all the possible worlds. I guess he could, he could use the same device of saying that there are these um, um, uh, yes, he could use the same device. Say possibly there is a, an actual world proposition. Blah blah blah. But. I, I, actually, I, no, 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 here we are. We have all the propositions. No, but the, the problem is this. The problem has nothing to do with possible. I, I, maybe I didn't make this clear. Um, Prior wanted to get rid of possible worlds talk, um, and that's possible worlds talk is not here in question. So both sides are using ordinary modal idioms. The question now is over possible versus actual individuals. So um, we still have the problem of specifying how these, in, we have to specify how the individuals behave. I mean, I, I don't, it's fine, you can talk about the possible world here instead of talking about what's possible. But the problem has to do with the possible individuals and how they behave. Because it's on the basis of their rock bottom behavior that we want, then want to discern what properties and sets and so on there are. So we have to have some way of describing in detail the behavior of the possible individuals. So using possible worlds here instead of no, I wasn't talking about possible worlds, I was talking about maximal proposition. Because at, at first, when you yeah, yeah, I'm, yeah, yeah, I'm saying, it we, seemed we, to me that, that, you, that you regarded uh, those two approaches as, as somehow on the same footing. Well, I'm just, I'm just, there, is, there isn't an issue here about possible worlds. So it's agreed on both sides that quantification of possible worlds makes perfectly good sense in this, in this particular dispute. Um, uh, so the issue really centers on the status of the possible individuals. So, uh, we have a question over here. Yeah, I, it's sort of related. I was just wondering, actually, also about the length of the mm -hmm. dots. Mm -hmm. And it's not only the length of this quantifier sequence, it's also the length of the conjunction. Right. In fact, right. the length of the conjunction is likely to be of a higher cardinality than the length of the because God quite, quite, yeah, quite, quite deceivably, yeah. 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 Um, and, 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 and so this is actually, has to be very powerful in planetary logic. Now the question is, if you consider the, the, the logical form of a statement where this becomes relevant, like the negation of there is a possible knife that, mm. describing it informally, you get by inserting the first plate into this given handle, mm -hmm. it is a possible knife that you get by inserting mm -hmm. the second blade into the same handle. Uh, and in the actual world, they're lying mm -hmm. side by side mm -hmm. in a drawer. Mm -hmm. um, how do we analyze that sentence? Is that now going to, the logical form going to be a conditional, the antecedent of which is this huge thing you wrote down, and the consequence of which is the, I think, natural formalization uh, of this sentence. Mm -hmm. And does that mean that in general, or even quite simple sentences, mm -hmm. will have these very high level uh -huh. logical forms Good. involving Good. Yeah. antecedents yeah. of this so great the, complexity? So let me deal with two, two issues here. One is that, um, first of all, I actually, I didn't actually write these infinitary sentences down. And you were able to gather from my what I said, what they were meant to be. So in actual fact, what we can do is specify indirectly what these propositions or sentences are, and then that way give finitary expression. So, we, so the translation wouldn't actually be infinitary. It would, it would be finitary, but in indirect reference would be made to these infinitary constructions. Okay. Uh, now, as to the other point, which is the, um, as you point out, this, this is going to be very, this is going to be as, as big as there are 
There are going to be many of these disjuncts as there are possible words. Okay. Um, the, uh, this is something I didn't talk about, but um, I think that this can also, the difficulty can also be removed. And the basic idea is this, um, that really what I can do is break this thing down into lots of different conjuncts. And in fact, when I say necessarily this, I mean, what I mean is, I go through all the other possibilities here and say that they're impossible. That's another way of saying it. So this just now is a, I say, if this is a different possibility, and I name you one different from the one I mentioned, that it's impossible, and so on and so forth. Okay, so I can replace this thing here by a bunch of impossibility statements, saying all the other alternatives that might have been possible are not possible. So now we have, we're going, without going into too much detail, we have a whole, a big long conjunction. Now I can describe all of those conjuncts. Okay, I can say, look, um, I'll use pi here. This is one of the conjuncts that's involved that's part of this huge description of the, uh, of the pluriverse. Uh, and then I can say all of those I can say then all of those conjuncts are true. So um, I guess it's a conjunction of all of these. So the idea is this. There is this description of the pluriverse. I turn it into a big, long conjunction. Uh, I describe the conjuncts of that conjunction. And then I say they're all true. And that's my description of the pluriverse. Now, when you look at each of these things here, what, they, what they'll look like really is something like this. They'll look like a description of each world from the perspective of that world. Just saying, here are the individuals. Uh, they exist. Nothing else exists. Blah, 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 blah. And so I do have to assume that that's OK. That's kosher. <laughs> Uh, that, is, that, is, that is that I can meaningfully talk about a description of that sort. But that's much less of a problem now. It seems I, to me. I wasn't actually thinking so much of that mm. particular problem, uh, but rather about the dots between the two conjunction signs in the second line. So that conjunction that you now have indicated this pi of C, yeah. that's going to be very long. Just it's going to be the same length as this. Exactly. This, but that's what I was talking about. Right, but I mean... If you if you replace the the, 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 the disjunction by within the necessity sign in the way you did, it just means adding more conjuncts to yeah. what you've got already. Now that's not going to increase the cardinality, but the cardinality of that conjunction is going to be intuitively possibly of a higher cardinality of the card of the next one up, the power set, of the total st string of different Yes. variables that you have. But we never, we never assume that that conjunction exists. What we do is we make a general statement. We describe what each conjunct is. We give a description of each What We say, this is what each conjunct, if this infinite conjunction were to exist, what looks like. Each of those conjuncts is true. Yeah. Uh, so all I have is a, uni I have a universal claim for all x of the form for all p, where p is a, that's you know p is one of the conjuncts. That's claim like that. Okay. That doesn't require me to say that all of these the corresponding conjunction exists. The length of this conjunction will be the length. The cardinality of the conjunction where it exists will be the cardinality of the number of, of the worlds. Right. Okay. I can certainly quantify overall worlds and say something about them. I'd say every world is such that it's a world. Okay. If you have cardinality words, you don't think the corresponding conjunction of the instances exist. But you should be perfectly happy admitting that one can say every world is such that it's a world. I'm afraid we're running <laughs> out of time here, so it does sound like a topic of conversation over lunch, maybe. <laughs> Um, and let's thank it for an absolutely fascinating talk.